My name is Sam Wilkinson. These will be my last words on Earth. I recently got a strange email at work and before I leave for good, I would like to tell you all about that email and what it led to. I don't care if you believe me or not, I just want to leave something behind. A confession if you will. I'll try to keep it brief, but I guess I should start from the beginning nonetheless. I've hated my life for as long as I can remember. It started on my first day of school. That was when the bullying began. I don't know what I did to deserve it or why it continued no matter how many times I changed schools. My only crime, it seems, was that I was fat. It was a vicious circle. The more they teased me, the more I ate to comfort myself. And the more I ate, the more they teased me. I became depressed and more and more socially awkward. As I got older and entered high school, I began to despise people in general. Basically everyone except my mom. My misanthropic worldview didn't exactly help me, I suppose. Let's just say my personality became less than lovable. I never moved away from home, and I spent most of my days in my mom's basement playing old video games. Such was my life. I'm already talking about it in past tense. My god, that's still my life. My biggest shame, my biggest guilt, is that my miserable condition made my poor mom unhappy. I've seen pictures from right after my birth. My mom looked at me with so much joy in her, then young eyes. At that time, she couldn't imagine what a worthless shadow of a person I would become. She imagined something different. She thought that little boy would grow up to become a man who eventually would give her grandchildren. She didn't think it would grow up to be me. I never learned any skills other than playing video games, so for the longest time I couldn't get a job. But that was how I liked it. I didn't want to be around people. However, about three years ago, my mom forced me to educate myself so that I could find work and help out with the rent that kept on getting higher and higher. Reluctantly, I agreed, and pretty much chose a subject at random at a vocational school, as close to home as possible. I didn't have a driver's license so I couldn't travel too far from home. I didn't mind that though, I wanted to be as close to home as possible anyway. The subject I chose wasn't fun. It was business administration, which pretty much just meant I would spend my time staring at spreadsheets in Excel all day. I never thought it would lead to anything, not because I didn't learn what I was taught, but because I didn't think anyone would be crazy enough to hire someone looking like me. However, after my internship at a large tech company, I won't mention its name here, but you've probably heard of it, I miraculously got hired. Although I had suffered all my life, it wasn't until this period of my life, which I'm living in right now, that I started considering ending my life. The stress was unbearable from the start. Every day when I took the bus to work I had to see how people actively chose not to sit next to me. The workplace had an open office space so I couldn't get away from people however much I tried and they couldn't get away from me. For some reason, I had to sit together with the people from HR, the loudest and most social people in the entire building. I had to listen to their small talk all the time while I stared at my horribly boring spreadsheets. And, not surprisingly, they didn't like me. Mostly, they pretended I didn't exist but as soon as I had to talk to them, or as soon as I accidentally met their eyes, I could see the revulsion in their eyes. Jennifer, the young woman next to me, hated me the most. She always greeted me with an expression of disgust, and I often saw her roll her eyes when I sat down next to her. She was visually annoyed as soon as I spoke to her. From time to time, I heard them talk about me behind my back. Jennifer didn't even care to lower her voice. I couldn't really go to the HR department with my issues. This was the HR department. This is what my life has been like for three years now. Recently, my boss called me to her office. Apparently, a complaint had been made against me. She said the person who made the complaint wanted to be anonymous, but I'm pretty sure it was Jennifer. My boss told me, with pity in her voice, that it concerned my hygiene. Why don't you take a shower in the morning, she said. I already did that, but after walking the few hundred meters to the bus station and after sitting on the bus more or less crippled with anxiety, I was sweaty again. I couldn't help it. 
Hearing this made me hate myself so much. My suicidal thoughts skyrocketed. The only thing that prevented me from actually killing myself was how much it would have hurt my mom. I couldn't do that to her. But guess what? A week ago, my mom died. When I came home from work, I found her on the floor of the living room. I could tell she had been lying there since early morning because she still had her dressing gown on. She was still alive, but she couldn't speak anymore. She gurgled with a confused look on her once so beautiful face. I called the ambulance immediately. She died at the hospital later that night. The doctor told me she had suffered a massive stroke. Of course this would have been devastating for anyone, but for me it pretty much meant the end of my life. From my perspective this world didn't have any decent people in it anymore. My boss didn't let me off work, not even to grieve my own mom. That was the kind of asshole she was, but it was just as well. Staying home would just have reminded me of my mom. Everyone knew what had happened when I came to the office. I could tell from the atmosphere. No one gave me their condolences. I imagined shooting myself in the head, blowing my brains out right in front of everybody. But I didn't own a gun. Instead, my actual plan was to jump out of the window. After all, we sat 50 floors up. There was no way I could survive a fall like that. I had never felt so sure about it before. I had made my decision. It was at that moment that I received the strange email. As I said, this was a week ago now. The email began, here's your access to the forest. A username and password followed and at the button, it said, regards, Leaf. Leaf was using a company email so I assumed he was from IT and that they had started using a new software or system. I did find it odd that he didn't explain what it was though. I didn't put too much thought into it though and just assumed it had already been explained at some meeting where I hadn't paid any attention. I asked Jennifer if she knew what it was. She shook her head with her typical attitude and said no, with the kind of tone you use when a creep asks you out on a date. As always I pretended like nothing, but inside, I couldn't help but feel as worthless as she thought I was. I took a quick look at the window and told myself to just do it. However, I wanted to wait until after my mom's funeral, soon I thought, and tried to picture Jennifer's reaction to seeing me jump. When I closed Excel a few hours later, just before lunch, I noticed a new shortcut on the desktop. The icon depicted a few pixelated trees. The forest, it was called. I thought it was kind of strange that it had just appeared out of nowhere. Usually I had to bring the computer down to the IT department to install new software. With nothing else to do, I clicked on the file. A program that reminded me of how software used to look in the 90s opened up in front of me. It didn't have that much content. There was a window that streamed what looked like a live video of a forest. I was able to use the mouse to look around 360 degrees, but other than that there wasn't much I could interact with. The video quality was pretty low, but it didn't look computer animated. However, I soon got the impression that it must have been a computer game, because under the stream there was a bar that let you set the speed of time. You could view the feed in real time, which was set as default, or increase the speed of time all the way up to 100 years per second. Beneath the speed settings, there were only two buttons, import and export. That was all. In the menu, there weren't that many options. Just about and quit. I clicked on about. It just said, made by Leaf. I played around with the program and pressed import. Surprisingly, a catalog with all the employees of my company popped up. I figured it was connected to Outlook, where a similar catalog was accessible. There was a search bar to make it easier to find who you were looking for. I looked up and saw my boss walk by. I closed the program immediately. I went home that day without opening the program again, afraid that my boss would ask me back to her office again. At home, I didn't think that much of the forest. I had more pressing things on my mind, to say the least. I was going to inherit my mom's house, but not that much money. I knew I would never be able to pay the rent and the other expenses by myself, and I didn't have any motivation to do anything about it. Thinking about this I lay down on the sofa in the living room, looking at the spot on the floor where I had found my mom reduced to a confused shell of her former self. From now on, I wasn't just falling apart mentally, but physically as well. Soon I would lose the house and, most likely, end up on the street. 
I didn't plan on doing that though. I fell asleep and saw the window at work in my dreams. It wasn't a nightmare. The nightmare would start as soon as I woke up. Next day I came to work one hour earlier than everybody else. Usually I avoided coming in that early, but now I didn't really want to spend too much time at home. Seeing the shortcut to the forest on my desktop made me curious again. I opened it. Everything looked the same, except it was nighttime in the forest now. The moon, more orange than our own moon, shone a sandy yellow on the leaves of the trees. I increased the speed of time to a few minutes per second. Nothing changed, but I soon realized that the clouds passing in front of the moon moved faster than before. Neat, I thought, without any actual emotion attached to it. After that, I tried to press the export button. The same kind of window opened up as when I'd pressed import but with no names in it. I went to the import window, looked at the list of names, and pondered what this was all about. Eventually, I decided to humor myself and searched for Jennifer. I selected her name and pressed import. A dialog box showed up. Are you sure you want to import Jennifer Norman into the forest? I pressed, yes, Jennifer's name disappeared from the list. I chuckled to myself, although I couldn't muster any actual joy, thinking that this program must have been some pretty funny inside joke down at the IT department. I went to the export window again. As I expected, Jennifer's name could be seen there now. Suddenly, my boss entered the office together with one of our colleagues. I quickly shut down the forest, opened Excel and pretended to work. More and more of my colleagues arrived, but not Jennifer. First I thought she was late for work, which wasn't unusual for her, and when she hadn't shown up before lunch, I assumed she was sick. I had a burger for lunch down the street. They didn't serve the best food, far from it, but it was the only place where I knew no one from work would eat. In the year 2525 played from the ceiling. I sat there, eating my burger and drinking my soda, while I listened to the song and thought about jumping out of the window. I thought I would do it at the end of the week, maybe on Friday, one day after the funeral. Back at work my boss came to the HR department and asked if anyone had seen Jennifer. Apparently, she hadn't called in sick after all. It wasn't until now my brain went to that impossible place. Did this had something to do with what I had done in the program? Obviously not but just in case, in some superstitious carefulness, I opened the forest and exported her. Are you sure you want to export Jennifer Norman from the forest? Yes, she disappeared from the list and appeared among the names in the import window again. One hour later, Jennifer stepped into the office. I figured she had just been late after all, just unusually so. As she got closer, something seemed off about her though. One of my colleagues, a friend of hers, stood up and ran toward her. Jennifer, she exclaimed. What happened to you? I looked up to see the interaction. I, I don't know Bella, I overslept. J just woke up. And, and I got here as quickly as I could, but I don't think I'm well. I think I have to talk to the boss about what happened to your face. Bella continued without listening. Is that real? And your clothes? Have you seen yourself in the mirror today? My god. I looked at Jennifer's face. It was crossed by a pretty nasty scar. Her clothes looked old and torn, almost as if she had had them on forever. What do you mean? Jennifer said and brought her hand up to her face. What? She ran into the bathroom, presumably to look herself in the mirror, and a few seconds later she screamed and came running out crying. Everyone stood up, even me, and watched her leave the office in a panic. At that moment it dawned on me. The time. It was set to several hours per second in the forest. I did some quick calculations in my head. If this had anything to do with me importing her, she would have been inside the forest for more than three years. While I sat and ate my burger down the street, listening to In the Year 2525, she had spent years inside. But it couldn't be real. That would have been ridiculous. Jennifer didn't come back to the office the next day. Her husband, I soon understood from the inevitable gossip, had called in and said she wouldn't be able to come back to work for a while. I arrived at the office even earlier this day. I opened the forest. It was still set to a few hours per second. I pulled it back to real time. Some birds, larger than any birds I've ever seen, flew in formation in the sky. I sped up time again, this time to a few days per second. The birds quickly disappeared from the sky and the moon replaced the sun and vice versa in close succession. The trees moved as if seen on a video being fast forwarded. This couldn't be a real forest, I thought. It just couldn't. 
Again, I slowed down time to normal. Thomas, a guy from the economy department that had always made silly jokes at my expense, came to the office. I looked at him as he walked toward his office space with his leather briefcase in his hand and his expensive watch around his wrist. He looked at me, I nodded, but he ignored me. I couldn't see his office space from where I was sitting, but as soon as he had passed by, I heard him placing his briefcase on his desk and opening it. I made sure the time was set to default and pressed import. Thomas Wachtmeister, I typed in the search bar and then I imported him. Are you sure you want to import Thomas Wachtmeister into the forest? I was. As soon as his name disappeared from the list, I carefully walked around the corner. His briefcase was lying on his desk, but he was nowhere to be seen. I went back to my computer. I looked at the video stream of the forest. It was in the middle of the day there, now. I slowly moved the camera 360 degrees to try and see if I could see Thomas somewhere. It made me feel like an idiot even trying this, given how impossible it was. I didn't see him anywhere, but I did see some weird animals. Two bluish giraffes, walking by. The low resolution made it near impossible to tell if they were real or animated, but given that they were blue giraffe, I just had to assume the latter. Thomas had probably just gone to the bathroom. Nonetheless, I made sure to export him. As soon as I did that, I heard something from his office space. I sneaked there to take a look. Thomas was standing up, seemingly confused. His usually water-combed hair was scruffy, as if he had just woken up. Hey, Thomas, I said. He looked at me, surprised he wasn't alone. I, I think I fainted, he said, blushing a little. What do you mean, I said. Are you okay? Well, I was just about to turn on my computer when suddenly, I was lying on the floor. Really? I looked down, trying to come up with something to say. Do you remember anything from the last couple of minutes? He looked at his watch. Uh, no, I blacked out. I excused myself, telling him it probably wasn't anything to worry about, and went back to my computer. I felt a bit excited, although I still didn't dare to believe. My colleagues started dropping in and I couldn't open the forest again for the rest of that day without anyone seeing it. During the day there was some more talk about Jennifer. Most of what I heard seemed to be rumors. No one talked to me about it of course, but it was difficult not to hear the whispers around me. One of Jennifer's closest friends at the office said she had called her and that it had been difficult to understand her. She had been obsessed with a certain nightmare that had returned to her as soon as she fell asleep. Something about being hunted by monsters deep inside a forest. It all started to seem too strange to be a coincidence. Was I responsible for Jennifer's condition? It made me feel weird. On the one hand, I never imagined myself doing something to harm anyone. I've never been a violent guy. But on the other hand, thinking that one of my tormentors had been forced to spend three years alone inside of a monstrous forest gave me some kind of satisfaction. I didn't dare to import anyone else the next day. I continued to contemplate my suicide, but more often than not those thoughts were interrupted by my thoughts about the forest. I spent two days looking at it, playing with the speed of time. I increased it to the max and saw the seasons flicker in and out. The trees grew, died, and were replaced by new trees. At one point there was a flash of light and all the trees were suddenly gone. I slowed down the speed. There had been a huge fire, it seemed. I sped up time again and after maybe a minute the trees grew up again and soon it was as if nothing had happened at all. The animals didn't return as quickly though, but eventually they came back as well. Most of the creatures I saw reminded me more of monsters than of animals. I saw an enormous white centipede with hundreds of red eyes. I saw some kind of snail or blob devouring a creature that reminded me of a huge stick insect. At one point one of the blue giraffes came close enough to the camera for me to see that it didn't have a head, just randomly placed mouths along its neck all filled with vicious teeth. Sitting in the safety of my office, watching these horrific creatures hunting each other on my screen gave me an odd feeling of coziness like being inside during a storm. And there were a lot of storms inside of the forest. Sometimes they raged for years and I had to speed up time to see the end of them. When turning the camera upward during these storms, I could see a purple nuance within the heavy clouds. All of this mesmerized me to such an extent that I didn't think much of the window, but I still knew that my life was over and that I didn't really have a choice. During Thursday, yesterday, I continued to observe the forest. Again, I pressed about. Made by Leaf. Who was he? I spent the better part of the day trying to figure that out. 
I opened his email to me again, copied his email address, and tried to find him in the list of employees. However, he didn't show up. Even though he had one of the company's email addresses, he didn't seem to be registered as an employee. I checked documents going several years back, but without any luck. The name Leaf never came up. I thought he might have resigned, but he should still have been seen in some of the records I checked. Eventually, I gave up trying to find him and went home without getting any significant work done that day at all. Today I was supposed to attend my mom's funeral. It would have been an important day for me, a day that could have given me some kind of closure. However, my boss wouldn't give me the day off. She said I hadn't sent in my application for taking the day off in time and perhaps she was right, but I mean, it was my mom's funeral for crying out loud. Of course I planned on just calling in sick and going anyway, but something in me just snapped when she did this. I couldn't take it anymore. It had to stop. My boss, my colleagues, and the company at large was a cancer not just in my life, but on society as well. All the hate I had built up over the years suddenly surfaced in a way I didn't think possible. Before this day I had no idea how it felt to be one of those guys who come into the office one day with a machine gun, but now I did. Of course, I didn't own a machine gun, but I had something else. The forest. I arrived early at the office. I knew that most of my colleagues were still asleep. Today they would wake up to a new surrounding. For some reason, my boss was in her office though. She couldn't see me from where she was, but I could hear her on the phone. It seemed to be an important call and it was probably the reason she had come to work so early today. I opened the forest. A storm poured its purple rain over the trees. For a few seconds I hesitated. My plan was simple. I would import the people I hated, which was pretty much everyone, into the nightmare on my screen and then I would open the window and end my own life knowing that all of the despicable people in my life would be consumed by monsters one by one. In a way, it was symbolic to do it on the day of my mom's funeral. My hesitation didn't last long. I pressed import and typed in the name of my boss in the search bar. The program asked if I was sure. I listened to her voice while she was talking to the phone and clicked, yes, yes, I know about the recession but we still have to. She suddenly went silent. It gave me goosebumps. I walked to her office. The phone was lying on her desk. I could hear a man on the other end of it. Hello, where did you go? I hung up the phone and returned to my own desk. I looked around in the forest, but I didn't see my boss anywhere. After this I started to import the rest of my colleagues, Jennifer included. It gave me the kind of enjoyment I suppose anyone would feel finally getting back at their enemies. Since I was going to kill myself, I didn't really consider the consequences of my actions. I just let my destructive impulses guide me completely. After I had imported the entire HR department, I couldn't stop myself. Instead, I continued to import people at the company. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, I said to myself. While I imported people I didn't even know, it was enough for me that they worked at the company. My hate had consumed me at this point. After a while, people started showing up on the screen. Jennifer was walking around in front of the camera. She stepped up to it and screamed something, but since there wasn't any sound I couldn't tell what she was saying. And then something came down from the sky and grabbed her. She fell down a few meters away, seemingly still alive. After that, I saw three men, still in their pajamas, running past the camera, hunted by what looked like a spider but that was really just eight legs coming out of the back of a corpse belonging to one of the blue giraffes. I don't know why, perhaps the severity of the situation became more obvious now when I could actually see the people in the forest. But I started to cry. It was a cry mixed with so many different emotions, but mostly with sorrow and hate. But I kept importing people. After a while, I realized that I could select more than one person at a time. I selected a random amount out of the thousands of employees on the list. Are you sure you want to import 167 subjects into the forest? Fucking yes. I felt empty inside after I clicked yes, like nothing mattered to me anymore. My last sliver of humanity had finally been lost. With a cold heart, watching my confused colleagues seeking safety from the storm in the forest, I increased the speed of time to a few days per second. It went too fast for me to see anyone. Suddenly, a dialogue box popped up. James O. Nielsen is about to expire. Do you wish to export? I pressed no. Now I knew I had killed. This happened a few more times until I just put the speed at maximum. Immediately a new dialogue box appeared. 
210 subjects are about to expire. Do you wish to export? Again, I pressed no. I went to the export list and saw that it was empty. I considered importing even more people, but decided my deed was done now. There was only one thing left to do for me. I looked at the window. My decision to jump didn't have that much to do with what I'd done. It wasn't a coward's escape from the police or anything. I knew that no one would be able to figure out where all those people went anyway. I would never get caught. My suicide was supposed to be the end of my suffering and that was why I still planned on going through with it. And now was the time, before I walked up to the window that I had fantasized about jumping out of for so long, I dragged the speed back to normal in the program. It was a sunny day in the forest. To my surprise, I could see a stream of smoke coming from the ground a few hundred meters away. I couldn't tell what its source was, but after a few minutes, I realized that it was people sitting around a fire. Later, one of them walked up to the camera. It was a man. He was wearing an animal skin and carrying a spear. A woman walked up next to him. They looked prehistoric. They kneeled in front of the camera and placed what looked like a piece of meat on the ground in front of it. Was it an offering? My first thought was that these people had always lived in the forest. But then it dawned on me that they must have been the descendants of the people I imported. Somehow they must have survived long enough to have children. I decided to prolong my suicide a bit so that I could watch these people. They didn't do much more though. After they had placed the meat they walked back to their camp and then they disappeared. So I sped up time again, a few years per second. After about 50 years, I slowed down again. This time there was some kind of altar around the camera made by rocks and flowers and I could see more campfires burning in the distance. I was fascinated by the fact that these people lived so primitive lives given that their forefathers were modern people. I then realized that everyone I had imported into the forest had been office workers. Their knowledge of Excel wouldn't have been very useful in the wild. With a burning curiosity, I sped up time once again. This time I allowed for a few hundred years to pass. When I put the speed back to default, the first thing I noticed was that the altar had been changed. This time, it looked more like a structure. Stones placed upon each other, but still in a primitive way. The people looked about the same, still wearing animal skins as clothes and wielding spears. This time, however, I noticed a woman carrying what looked like a bow and arrows. They were still in the Stone Age though, so I sped up time yet again and this time, I let approximately 3,000 years pass before I returned the settings to normal again. This only took half a minute on my end, with the speed setting put at maximum. To my surprise, the inhabitants still hadn't surpassed the Stone Age. The altar was a bit more advanced though, it now resembled Stonehenge. A bit disappointed at their slow development, an idea formed in my head. Now driven by curiosity more than hate, I pressed import again. I knew I was about to change someone's life with my actions and do so without their consent, but it somehow didn't feel like a big deal anymore. I suppose I had gotten used to it by now. I looked up the smartest people I knew among the employees. There was only three of them, depressing, I know, a medical doctor who had changed her career midlife, an engineer who had worked on some of the company's more experimental projects, such as the development of more sustainable energy sources, and a cleaner who had worked as a dentist in her home country. I imported them and sped up time for a few minutes, letting half a century pass in the forest, while I barely had time to scratch my head. This time, things had changed dramatically. The people didn't seem to live like nomads anymore, but in villages. At least, there was a village built around the camera so I assumed there must have been more of them. Finally, it looked like the inhabitants had become farmers. They were using carts with wheels and I even saw them riding the blue giraffes, like horses. The small guilt I had felt when importing the three more knowledgeable individuals quickly disappeared when I saw what they had contributed to during their stay inside the forest. I spent about an hour watching the people in the village until I sped up time again. I took my time since I knew my colleagues wouldn't come in for work today. When I set the speed back to normal, the people were living in what could only be regarded as a town. It still looked like the village, but it was bigger and had objects made of metal in it, such as weapons and tools. Perhaps this was the Bronze Age. About 20 people, dressed in white robes, were praying around the camera. They reminded me of a mixture of Hindus and Muslims. Their their religious devotion to the camera made me feel important in a way I've never felt before. After all, these people wouldn't have been born without me. In a way, I truly was their god and a part of me felt like it. I sped up time, and once again I noticed that nothing much happened. 
development was slow. At one time, the camera was trapped within a set of walls. I couldn't see anything, but since I was watching the forest at a speed of one year per second, the walls quickly disappeared. Why had they been there? Had there been some kind of change in their religion? Houses went up and down, storms came and went. After a while, I witnessed the first war. I slowed down time, but the war went by so fast that it ended before I could see any of it in real time. The town was burning and people, women and children, lay dead on the ground, while people with paint on their faces walked around with spears longer than the ones I had seen before. Blue giraffes with empty saddles were feasting on the corpses with their long, terrifying necks. Something had changed on the screen. Somehow, mankind had survived in the forest. It had taken them a thousands of years to rebuild it, just as if they had had to start from scratch again. But the city was back. When I slowed down time, letting a few more hundred years pass in the forest, I noticed that the city was larger than before. The skyscrapers reached further up into the sky and, to my amazement, I could see thousands of vehicles flying through the air. I used the camera to look around, and when I looked up towards the sky, I could see lights on the surface of the orange moon. People were living there now. As I watched this world, now completely transformed from a horrific wilderness to what looked like a technological paradise far surpassing anything on earth. I cried tears of a happiness I've never felt before in my entire life. I looked at the window in my office and at the boring, primitive city stretching out into the horizon on the other side of it, and then at the city glittering on my computer screen. I thought about my beloved mom. She would have wanted me to live. This was before I started writing this, my last words on earth. I just clicked on import. Are you sure you want to import Sam Wilkinson into the forest? Before I press yes, I just want to say one more thing. If you ever get an email from a man named Leaf with a login to the forest, say thank you from me. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.